Hey guys, so Cal Val here. You are listening to the Hitting the Turnbuckle podcast. Welcome everybody back to another Cutting Edge interview and this week we have one of the most decorated, well one half of the most decorated tag teams in wrestling. He has a table, luckily for me he's sitting on a chair at a table looking through a screen just about to talk to me. It is Mr. Devon Dudley himself. How are you sir? I'm good, not bad at all. A lot of running around here in Dudleyville, but I made it to the podcast. You did make it to the podcast, and we are forever grateful for, to, for you to do so. Um, just quickly before we begin about ECW and get into that, it's the year 2024. Tag team wrestling has started to, I would say, you know, it's had a dip and then it went back up, and now it's really progressing through. We've seen a lot more tag teams, we've seen a lot more trios. What are your thoughts now on how tag teams in are in 20, or how tag team wrestling is in 2024? Well, I think the talent nowadays are a lot more has a lot more athleticism in them, uh, especially from when we were, um, you know, a tag team and going strong. They're doing things that we didn't do back then. Hmm. But then, if you think about it, that's pretty much just about every new era. <laughs> that comes from. You know, take for instance basketball. You know, right before Dr. J, Julius Irvin. Nobody was really dunking the basketball. He comes along and he does a dunk and it's like he's the doctor, you know? And then all of a sudden, Michael Jordan comes in and just, you know? So it's one of those things where, you know, each generation, you know, gets faster, stronger, um, you know, bigger. And they start thinking of more crazy things to do. Yeah, I certainly so, do. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of the Usos, and I know they say, well, they're not together anymore, but in my heart, they will always be together, regardless to what storyline they're doing. The Usos, as far as I'm concerned, are the top tag team uh, to be. And everybody goes, oh, what about the New Day, FTR, and all of that? FTR is good. I'm not saying that they're not. They are good, but there's something about the Usos that I just can't let go. No, I agree. I think they are the best tag team. Kind of. FTR run a close second for me. I like it because they're kind of old school with a bit of blend of new school. I, I grew up sort of, you know, uh, late 80s. So it's like, you know, Midnight Express, Power, Glory, Rockers, Demolition, Legion of Doom, people like that. So I remember that. Uh, era. So FTR give us a bit of that with a bit of sort of new age wrestling, I think, back in. But the Usos for me are top. But let's go back, way back when, uh, ECW. So in England, we didn't really get a lot of ECW. Uh, we got it like a month delay at like 3 a.m. On, on a TV station called Bravo. What was it like working? I mean, they were like, it was crazy times in ECW back then. We had Just Incredible on recently. So two questions. What was it like working for ECW? And secondly, um, if you had, if ECW had a streaming deal, like if internet now was much as it is and all the streaming stuff uh, was available then, now, would they still be here, do you think? Well, to answer the first question, it was like being an ECW was great. Mm -hmm. We were a family. We were a bunch of misfits that nobody wanted. But yet Dr. Frankenstein, Paul Heyman, <laughs> was in the stars and did for us what nobody else could do. Um, you know, it was just one of those things where I'm very proud to be a part of that era, to be a part of that crew. And when people talk about ECW, with so many stars that have come out of there that have remembered, the Dudley boys are usually number one when you talk about ECW. So I'm happy about that. You know, you've had so many other stars, Taz, Sabu, RVD, uh, Shane Douglas, Bam Bam Bigelow, Chris Candido, Francine, the Pitbulls, uh, the Eliminators, the Gangsters. I mean, I can go on and on. Axel Rodden, Ian Rodden. There's so many people that have come out of ECW that is still remembered to this day. And again, it was an honor and privilege to be a part of that. Now, the second question, would ECW be around with all the streaming? 
I'm going to have to probably say no. Hmm. And I say that because of the fact that, you know, it was no secret that ECW fell on hard times financially. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was very hard at the time to keep that going. Um, I also feel that even though I said earlier, the generation gets quicker, faster, and stronger, there was a certain toughness that my generation in ECW had that you will probably never find again. You will probably never find anybody that have put their bodies on the line the way we did. So, and knowing that, plus society is just too sensitive right now. Some of the things we were saying, some of the things we were doing were just un unheard of. And you can't get away with that today. No. Definitely not. You wouldn't better get away with a lot of that. No, definitely not from back in. Do you have a, a well, a, a funny road story about ECW that you could tell? Um, I was in the, the hotel room with, we were sharing a room, Jack Victory, Sign Guy Dudley, and Lance Wright. And everybody knew I was petrified of snakes. <laughs> it went and got one of these rubber ball constrictor snakes <laughs> and they curled it up in the corner and we had a terrace in our room. So it was right there, right by the curtain. So they were making a big deal about trying to get the screen door open for the terrace. And I was like, guys, it's not that hard. So I'm trying to open the door and I can't get it open. But when I look to the side, I see the stick is still in the door. I go, guys, the stick is still in the door. What the hell? I'm like, take the damn stick out of the door. I go to reach for the stick. I move the curtain a little bit, and there's a damn ball constrictor curled up uh, <laughs> in, on, the, on the floor. And I'm screaming and yelling. Everybody's laughing. I go, what are you laughing for? It's a damn ball constrictor. We're in New Orleans. That's normal here. I was like, I don't need to be out. No, I'll never come back here again. I said, I'm done. And Sign Guy and Jack Victory, they're all laughing and just having a good time at my expense, of course. Of course, <laughs> to be fair, I'm, I'll probably be petrified of a snake as well. I'm no good with that. <laughs> Not good for me. Um, obviously, leaving WWE, coming, uh, leaving ECW, coming to WWE, teaming with Bubba for so long. But then, so 2002 time, it was finished. You would on SmackDown. I think Bubba may have been on Raw. You portrayed a new gimmick. Do you think at that point it was a necessary split just to see how the singles route would go for both of you? I think that was Vince McMahon's plan. Uh, to see because you know Vince McMahon has never been too high on tag team wrestling. Mm -hmm. He will try as much as he can out of it. And when he feels it's done and over, he slits you up. Uh there was still a lot more in us uh to do, but Vince didn't see it that way and he split us up. So with that being said, you know, I love the gimmick. The Reverend Devon gimmick I thought was great. Were there too many people in my ear? trying to tell me how to do it? Yes. When Vince let me have control of it, it worked out great. There was no issues, nothing. But the minute certain people took over and started putting their little two cents in it, it went south. But even when, it, even when they started putting their two cents in, I went to Vince and begged him to let me get a shot at it and let me do it my way. It was kind of like he got annoyed because he was like, oh, we got to get you out of this mess and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we got to put you in a new gimmick. And I begged him. I said, no. I said, we don't want to. Then I said, you know, with all due respect, I said, let me be me. Let me do me. I said, and it'll happen. And even though I had that talk with him, he still didn't let me be me. Hmm. Interesting. So, that would have worked. It never went anywhere after that. So it was what it was. It was what it was indeed. Would have to ask you, you get a lot of these questions about, you know, the, the amazing matches that you guys had with, you know, Edge and Christian, Matt Hardy's. What, why was the chemistry so good between you guys that made those matches so memorable? Because we were hungry. We're on the same page and we were looking for the exact same thing. We weren't trying to outdo each other. We were trying to make magic. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, it was six guys that understood the business and how it worked. And once that happened, sky was the limit. Yeah, it certainly was. I mean, those matches were absolutely incredible. Um, WWE in 2005 brought back what it was meant to be one night standing. I know they've done a couple and then rebranded ECW. 
for that one night stand pay-per-view how did it feel for you former ecw guys to go back home kind of think to that hammerstein ballroom the setting the nostalgia all of those classic fans were there what was that day and night like for you doing the one night stand initially well the hammerstein ballroom you know that wasn't where mm. I, ecw should have been yeah it was a time to say goodbye to something that helped us to become stars um and i was very happy with that I would have preferred it to be at the ECW arena mm -hmm. or the Lost Battalion Hall in Queens, because that's where we had a lot of our memorable stuff there. Not just the Dudleys, but everybody that walked through the door in ECW. So, you know, it is what it is where we had it, but we still created magic and history that night. And it finally gave Vince McMahon, uh, it finally made him see what the big fuss about ECW was. Because although, you know, he might have had an inkling of what it was, he still didn't know. But he had to sit through a whole show and watch these bloodthirsty ECW South Philadelphia New York fans. And, you know, things that he would never put on his TV, but he allowed it to be on this because it was ECW, how it worked and how the people loved it. And just how much of a diehard fan fans uh, were of ECW. You know, he's got to remember, if it wasn't for ECW, there would be no attitude there. Exactly that. And it was a tremendous show. I said, we knew, we saw it over here in terms of we could see it every now and again. And it was crazy just sort of what we would come in from a, you know, we'd be out with friends, would come in and this just like, wrestling would be on and it'd be tables kendo sticks you had no new jack coming out and going crazy diving off balconies and, and whatnot it certainly made the attitude era what it is and, and you're right without that there wouldn't have been an attitude era, and we wouldn't be sitting here today talking about the, the attitude era in in wrestling which is it was a it was a, such a great uh, moment it felt as if you know when it come on and and paul Heyman was in in the ring and the crowd of chanting and, you know, Jerry Styles come out and it just erupted. Jerry Styles, probably one of the best play-by-play -play, uh, commentators that there, it was going as well. Um, just lastly, and touching on Paul Heyman quickly, going in the Hall of Fame this year was quite a surprise because I didn't think he would do it while he's still active, but fully deserved in your opinion? Of course. Look, I just said it. If it wasn't for the added, if it wasn't for ECW, there would be no attitude ever. Why wouldn't you recognize that? Why would that even be a thought in anybody's mind? You know, he helped transcend transcend the business. He helped put the business where it is today. So as far as I'm concerned, he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Um, you know, I love Paul there, uh, especially for everything that he's done for me and myself, uh, along with the rest of the Dudleys and the whole locker room of ECW. Thank you for giving a chance to people that nobody else would give a chance to. He bet on it, and he won. Yeah, absolutely. Fully deserved. Can't wait for it. I can't wait for the speech. That could be quite interesting. <laughs> but um, aside from WWE, you've had, you went to TNA for nearly 10 years. Yourself and Bubba done some great magic there as well. One storyline in particular that I just thought had something... And it did get there, but then it fell away. It was was the aces and eights, which you guys were played a big part of. It really could. I don't know. It just felt like it felt flat before it could get going. What do you think went wrong there? I don't. I, I don't. I don't agree with you on that. I okay. think it was a mess. I think it lasted a lot longer than anybody else thought it would last. If I'm not mistaken, I think it lasted about three, maybe almost four years. So that's a long time for a storyline nowadays uh, to last. Um, but, you know, Eric Bischoff was the creator mm. of the Aces. Um, and so with that being said, when other people that were coming in to TNA that was quote unquote office, thinking that they had an idea of how Aces and Eight should run, Dixie gave them full blanche to go in there and mess things up. And that's exactly what happened. So Aces and Eights could have probably went off another three or four years. But it didn't, and it was because people were sticking their nose in where it didn't belong. Hmm. Yeah, it certainly felt something was exactly for us. It was it felt as if it was really hot. It was getting hot. Obviously, Bully Ray turning, joining you guys was amazing in in the cage. I, I loved it. I just thought it was. I don't know. I just felt it kind of fell flat when it could have, as you said, had a lot more legs to it. 
when is maybe as you say that the back office people there um may have ruined that or people within power there may have ruined that for sure what was your if you could pick and this is a long this is a quite a big question in your career you've had so many great matches if you could select two or three teams to go in and maybe in like in a four corners match throughout your career who would be the three teams that you would have against you guys the Hart Foundation, the British Bulldogs, the World Warriors, and Doc and Gordon. Wow, interesting. Three, a lot of different teams there. What would you put? I mean, British Bulldogs are great. What was it the British Bulldogs done for you that would have made that match, do you think, magical? I mean, well, just watching the Dynamite Kid and Baby Boy Smith, their way of doing things, I think they were way ahead of their time. Hmm. Uh, the snap suplexes uh, with the Davy Boy Smith, with the you know, with the power slam and all that, just everything that they did, I think, was way, way before their time back then, and that type of style could be today. Yeah. So, you know, I think that they could have definitely stole the show in that match, uh, and especially the Dynamite Kid, who I was a huge fan of, uh, just the way he sold what he did in the ring. Um, how he responded to so many things. I mean, it was it was great seeing him. Yeah, it really was. I'm going to say that very. I was very young at that time of, of the, the British Bulldogs. Remember him very, remember him very, very well. Uh, obviously, helps being a, a fellow UK uh, person as well because you, you tend to draw those uh, closer to those guys. I, I I love the British Bulldogs. I thought they were great. Uh, so I mean, it would be an interesting match. You've got family though in the business now. And I know you've got obviously there's a wrestling school as well, which we'll get to. What do you what say advice do you give even say your sons now or people in a wrestling school that perhaps you wouldn't have given maybe 10 years ago because something has changed in the industry? Well, I don't think that I would change anything. Um, it's always been taught to me and it went from generation to generation. Respect, mm -hmm. know your craft and learn the business from someone who's been somewhere. I don't care how much this person tries to profess his love for the sport or for the companies at hand. If he ain't never been, but yet he has that much love for it, how is he going to tell you how to get to someplace that he's never been? Mm -hmm. Go, you know, you have to be with someone that basically knows the business inside and out, that has created something in terms of a name or some type of history within the business, I think once you find people like that, the sky's the limit. Yeah, indeed. Indeed, I, I agree. I mean, th there's got to be there's got to be loads of different things to be able to, to, to teach and, and learn when you're in school. But your boys kind of was on TNA before they, you know, before they started. This. Did that kind of help them a little bit? Did they sort of, when they were in TNA and, and all that storyline happened, did it give them a bit more of a, oh, we'd like to do this one day? Uh, they had always wanted to do it even before TNA. Mm. Um, it was a confident booster to let them know that they could do it. And I was very happy um, in the end that they were able to shine and do what they do. It's like I'm very proud of them today. Mm. Um, you know, my boys are very, very talented. Um, and I, I believe that they're even better than me and Bubba in terms of athlete-wise. Uh, you know, they're, they're stronger at the age that they're at now. They're a lot stronger than what we were. They, they have a lot more oomph about them than we do. Uh, but I, I don't know if they're at the level of toughness. I think they're tough. But for us, we had to be sick individuals to do what we did. But yeah, yeah. Coming from going to XCW, you certainly needed to be, uh, yeah, very sick and twist-minded in there for the stuff that they do. They they recently, I think, last year competed in the Crockett Cup in the in the NWA. How was that experience? Well, we cover the NWA on, on this channel. Uh, we can't watch it anymore, unfortunately. It's not. We haven't got the CW app, and we can't get it. But how did they enjoy that the Crockett Cup experience? Oh, from my understanding, they they loved it. I think we need to have them on their show. Have them on your show and ask them yourself. <laughs> I would love to have them on your. <laughs> I can't speak for them, but you know they. As far as I'm, as far as I know, they enjoyed themselves. They had a really good time. Uh, they met some interesting people, and uh, they got some good advice from people as well. Definitely, I don't agree because 
obviously knowing the, the roster and the people that work behind the scenes there, there's certainly a lot of experience uh, there to sort of, you know, draw upon and to ask those questions. And yes, we would love that these sons on the show. I'll have to reach out to them and see if they uh, could spare uh, 30 minutes of their time. We'd love to have a chat with them. Um, as we're kind of winding down, d we're getting near the end of the interview uh, time uh, now. WrestleMania is coming up. We're two weeks away. Yeah, two weeks. Uh, obviously a two night thing now. So two questions. One, what do you make of it being two nights? And two, is Cody going to finally finish the story? I, you know, I'll go backwards here. I don't know if Cody's going to finish the story or not. If he doesn't, then he doesn't. Apparently they have something in mind. I think fans need to stop crying and bitching about it and just watch the show. Okay, it's a it's a male soap opera, guys. Stop trying to hijack the show and watch. You know, back in the day when I was watching wrestling, there was no internet. You voiced your opinion by writing in, uh, writing letters and sending it in to the office and things like that. And even then, we weren't crazy enough to sit there and tell the promoters how to do it. You know, but these fans think they can do that, and that's some of the problems today with the business. You know, you're not going to sit up there and tell Sylvester Stallone how to do another Rocky movie, you know, but you can tell us how to, we can do our jobs. Remember, you pay to see us, not to be sitting up there in the office and writing the storylines. Let us do that. And if you honestly think that Cody Rose isn't happy with what he's doing now, storyline-wise with The Rock and everything else, you're out of your damn mind. Go back in your parents' basement and wait for the apple pie to come down and then get on your internet and start crying again. That's what you need to do because, if again, if Cody walked away from something like AEW, which he helped create, and he could pretty much do whatever he wants, I'm sure he could probably do the same thing again. So if you think Cody Rose is not behind all of this or helping, then you're out of your mind. Let them entertain you the way they should be entertained and leave it alone. You know, enough said, you know, uh, but as far as um, having two nights of WrestleMania, you have to, at this point, you can't jumble everything in one night anymore. It's becoming too much. You know, even if they get the best matches in the world, try to sit through 11 to 12 matches from 6.30 uh, in the afternoon to one in the morning, it's very, very hard. Mm. And if you have a lot of kids at the show, it's very hard for their extension span to last that long. So you need to break it up into two nights. Smart and brilliant idea where we came up with it. Yeah, I agree. I enjoyed the two nights of WrestleMania and I wholeheartedly agree with the whole Cody uh, situation with people trying to dictate it. I love the fact that The Rock come back and I even love the fact we were going to get The Rock Roman because people seem to forget that that was the match everyone wanted before last year's WrestleMania anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So why didn't they just let it plan out? It, hey, listen, I'm not one of those crybabies. I was one of the ones that wanted to, <laughs> waited to see what was happening with bait and breath. And we still are waiting to see what's going to happen with bait and breath because it is still going on and it's still one of the best, uh, well, certainly one of the best storylines, bloodline has been for many, many years anyway. So let it, mm -hmm. pan, out. Let it pan out, people. But d it has been, for me... Uh, an absolute honor to talk to somebody like yourself that's had such a decorated career in, in wrestling. Uh, thank you for taking up some of your time uh, today to talk to me. It's been a, an absolute privilege uh, for you to have you on the show. Yes, we'll try and get your sons on at some point. I will definitely try that. Um, but for everybody at home, thank you so much for watching and tuning in. He has been one of the most decorated tag team wrestlers of all time. You can get a table and put someone through it now, just not me. <laughs> He has been Devon Dudley. I have been your host, Adam Cousins. And until next time, everybody, take care, all the best, and good night.